and he is going to speak. He is going to speak about artificial intelligence for infectious diseases, with a focus on pneumonia, TB, and uh, COVID-19. His talk will provide a walkthrough about how artificial intelligence guided tools helps in predicting and detecting infectious diseases such as pneumonia, tuberculosis, and COVID-19. Infectious disease prediction and unexploited data will be discussed as predictive analytic tools are limited to education and training, at least for COVID-19. It also covers shallow learning, such as handcrafted features, as well as deep learning mechanism in both image modalities CT scan, chest x-ray, and he will finish off with big data and discuss its two key points, that is data augmentation and transfer learning. Uh, briefly about Professor Santosh, before joining University of South Dakota, he worked as a research fellow at the U US National Library of Medicine within the National Institutes, Institutes of Health. He was a postdoctoral research scientist at the Loria Research Center with industrial partner ITSoft of France. He has demonstrated expertise in artificial intelli intelligence, machine learning, pattern recognition, computer vision, image processing, and data mining with applications such as medical imaging, informatics, document imaging, biometrics, forensics, and research analysis. Uh, with that, uh, Professor Santosh, we are indeed honored to have a keynote speaker of such repute and achievements to address us. Over to you, Professor Santosh. Thank you very much for a nice introduction. You hear me okay? Yes, we can. Cool. Thank you, uh, uh, Professor Abdel Krim. We had, we had um, uh, quite quite a discussion about what time, because of time difference, kind of hard to figure out what time I it could be the best suited. Uh, I can speak, and thank you again. It's it's been I I believe after seeing proceedings, I believe the conference has got, went really good. Thank you so much. All right, so back to the slide. Let me share something else. It's it's pretty much hard to, you know, tell a story from a distance. Though we we kind of managed uh, things since last year. Mm. Let's go and take a look. Here I have. I see all right things. Uh, anybody? Any problem? No, it's clear. It's clear. So yeah. what am I going to do? Is to make it bigger. Yes. Uh, nice. Now it's, it becomes more nice. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. So, so Professor Abdul Krim told me that it's going to be forty minutes talk and ten minutes Q and A, right? Yes. I would definitely have to say good afternoon over there because good good morning here. And if if somebody is from outside Morocco, then probably good night, because uh, you know <laughs> you know it, you never know. So we we kind of having all kind of greetings for everybody all people across the world. I'm Casey Santos again, uh, uh, chairing the Department of Computer Science at USD, uh, University of South Dakota. And the conference title basically attracted me to, to give a keynote kin talk. The conference title is so good, I'm pretty much sure that it's gonna go long. Today's talk, uh, basically discussing is about AI for infectious disease outbreak. And I'll take few examples from pneumonia, uh, tuberculosis, and COVID-19. COVID-19 will cover a lot, tuberculosis cover a lot, and pneumonia cases basically happen both both sides. T TV has got pneumonia cases too, COVID-19, a kind of pneumonia, but it's not really pneumonia, right? Not those conventional pneumonia. And don't forget to follow me, We I've got this uh, PAMI pattern analysis machine intelligence lab at USD computer science and it's, it's, be, it's been growing so far. And if, if anybody has got any idea or would like to connect with me, work on, under my supervision, please. We have uh, funds available for international students and scholars as well. 
that's me. Before I start my talk, I would like to tell you, or I'd like to convey you that my new programs in, in the state of South Dakota, that is artificial intelligence, the only state's only artificial intelligence program. So we have got a specialization and we also have we also have certificate for both undergrad and graduate students. We're in the process to have this make it online for other, other institutions and in, on our radar, uh, Singapore and also Malaysia, International Medical University in Malaysia, we are in collaboration for making these things done. So to, students can take courses from there and we give online certificate. So today's talk, uh, all these things what we are gonna talk all about me, not about my uh, institutions and, and residency or university I'm, I'm affiliated with. Well, if you see the left side, this the left one, left one is uh, a summer uh, USD campus. The right one is basically winter. Our summer is beautiful and winter is harsh, all right? It's, it's kind of a, a nice thing, but you got really good experience on both sides. Let's talk a little about smart healthcare. What do you mean by smart, smart healthcare? We'll be moving toward um, um, uh, infectious disease, but let's talk about smart healthcare. What should, what should we have? Let's say by 2030. You should have a, a clear and, and healthy talk or communication between you meaning patients and the doctor or any, any stops in hospital. How can we do that? There must be surveillance. Otherwise people can yell you because you don't walk properly or you yell them because they don't, they don't give you a good response. Possible, right? So hospitality is always important in hospital settings. It is not only in business areas where, uh, you know, hotels and everything, they do very nice work. Good morning, sir. How are you doing? Uh, do you want a coffee? That's very nice. But how about these things happening in the hospital too? That's going to be cool too, right? So it's space processing, but basically communication between you, patients, and doctors or any staffs important. And this should be stored. This should be saved. And you you go hospital is because you got a problem. So you got many, too many biomedical devices taking your data, extracting data for uh, decision making purpose. Sometimes cholesterol is tough, sometimes these, sometimes that, sometimes BM, BMI, sometimes MRI, so many things. So it's because doctors want you to doctors want you do it. Right? And and possibly most of the time we've got chest x-rays, you know, CD scans, this that I, I said test because we talk about test today. So all these things at the end of the day, you got transcription, either handwritten or printed. If it is printed and you don't know what is in there, you are, go ask doctor and he's gonna write on the top of printed documents, basically, right? So it's a document analysis problem. When you see on the top, from the top to bottom, there are so many different type, data types, code. there are data types talking about exact same event. You have one problem. You're looking for one problem to solve. And you have communication, speech processing. You have all, all these biomedical devices and data collection. And you have x-rays or CT scans or other things, basically I'm talking about image data. And you also have image data, which is machine printed documents or on the top of that people write because I don't know what it's gonna do, what am I going to do? So doctors and nurses or staffs gonna write, oh, you take this one, you take that one, something like medications, right? Well, talking about all these things, basically you got, you got to do space processing, data analysis, you know, processing, pattern recognition, image processing and pattern. So all these things you got, you got to do and having things done. We are basically obsessed with, with the term deep learning or AI. And we have a deep learning uh, somewhere in the middle. And that's a black box and gonna make something. Deep learning can make your things visualized, visualization, basically visualization is very important to talking about many different data types. But the same event, I'm talking about same disease, and connections. If the speech processing, the communication, you know, speech data is here, for instance, here, and the other data is all the way there. So how far uh, other type of data talking about same events, were they consistent enough? That's what the visualization is about. All, all these data, these, these bubbles are one data types, right? So same thing. And you have, if you, if you come to see the consistency checking about 
the data types, all these sources of data are talking about one event, then you basically have to know whether they talk about same event or not, because I'm, I'm having COVID-19 and I wanna see all these data, data types talking about the same thing. How about that? So if it is that, then of course, some of the data go away, some of the data go away, so, but most of the data talking about the same event, but that means we, we look after consistency checking, very good for uh, grant writing or so, because it is important to take a look whether all data types, they, they are talking about exact same event that we're looking for. That means consistency checking. And decision making should not be based on other experts, basically doctors, because doctors, they do have sentiments. Even you have COVID-19, he's gonna say, you fine, don't worry, that because I have seen 200 people in the morning, they get COVID-19 positive. Doesn't mean that I'm going to be fine. So we need some machine, a machine who has no bias, no sentiments, make decisions so we can go for mass screening. Long story short, if we want to have a disease type characterized or analyzed well, having a consistent decision-making result, meaning results, then you need to have not just, you need to rely not just on one type of data, but all type, all possible types of data. That's what we call smart healthcare. And I'm dreaming to make this by 2030. When we talk about that many data types, then obviously your data is big, but who is gonna define this? How big is big data is big? Who's gonna define? Nobody. Are we talking about 8085 microprocessor? Then in, in Excel, it is big for 8085. Are we talking about the, the computer we buy today? We can do terabytes, even with one grant, meaning $1,000, uh, uh, computer, it's 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 okay. So basically, people really don't know the definition of uh, uh, big data. Of course, big data is all about terabytes. Of course, big data is about uh, continuous uh, collection. So velocity, velocity, these that right, all these four different uh, different types, different items. We we take into but we most of the time academics use this word is a buzzword. So I would like. Everybody understand how big is a big data is big. It's not because the data is big. Oh, I got 200 ter terabytes of data. That's why it's big. It's possibly not because they talk about something. But check it out here. When you have masses, we have uh, population health, public health care. How many people do you, you got every day? Every day, how many people bought and give a birth? Meaning everybody, the day they give a birth, they have to be get registered. They have to get registered in hospital settings. Meaning you have all different types of data all different types, numeric data to text data. And the numeric data is not just about numbers, but they also have the metrics, some e scale unit, weight, weight in, in terms of pounds or kilogram, pressure, BM, uh, B, pressure, MMHG, height, centimeter or inches or whatever, right? So these metrics tell us what it is. So if we go for data mining tool for no reason and forget about all these metrics stuff, then data mining tool, you know, hitting data mining tool or just deploying data mining tool don't make any sense. It is important for us to take a look what data mining tool and where we can we can use. Can one tool happen to be a right tool? Maybe not. Relax, so think about image data. Image data is also there. And text data because the people write. Everybody's there. So if you talk about public health here, that's what the big data is because I'm producing that many data that you're producing that many data for every event, even means pathology we talk about, it's a lot. So for everybody, when we talk about artificial intelligence, when we talk about pattern recognition, machine learning, and many more, uh, I used to ask people that, what do you do? I see the guy said, I'm doing pattern recognition because I'm talking about pattern recognition at that particular time, right? Then, then I asked him, him, the same guy, same, another day, well, what do you do? Tell me, tell me about yours. Oh, I do signal processing and machine learning. Well. Come on, you keep changing. It's because we change every day. So there was a paper sometime in 1993, 90s. There was a guy, meaning the, uh, the founder of Google team, he acquiring graphics recognition, Loria. I'm talking about France, in area, non Grandis Research Center. Uh, the, the, our founder, meaning the, Team leader at that time was, was he, he wrote this paper, don't tell mom I'm doing document analysis. Analysis, he believes I'm in the computer vision field. Pretty much enough, right? So we should make things complicated. We just do things, what, what, whatever it is, and we just tell exactly what we are, 
right? So let's not make things complicated. We do things. All right. So here's the thing. Like I said before, the public data, if we really go or move into public data, it's all about big data. It is not just about numeric data. It's not about image data. It's not about text data. It's all, all, all in there because metrics scaling, it's all important. Right, but but again, the, don't forget in two thousand five, two thousand six, when uh, when the people moved moved from moved from two thousand five to 20, 2000, 2006, then the database engineers became data scientists overnight without any understanding clue about what is data mining. Database engineers do structured uh, information retrieval, while data scientists do all kind of things. So we're happy with the sexy term all the time, right? So, but we should we should be worried. We should be really worried about all these kind of things. So, this is take a message. Let's go back. We did talk about smart healthcare. We did talk about how big, big data is big. But I can have a, a, an hour talk a discussion about how big data is big. But we fix. And we'll talk this one. I will take this one at the end. And we also did, did talk about uh, a lot of um, you know uh, anomalies that we do uh, in terms of using. Uh, terminologies like pattern recognition, signal processing, all these things. Pulmonary abnormalities basically uh, are the problem in lung disease. The problem in lungs, so so it means lung disease. So one is asthma, lung cancer, pneumonia, uh, tuberculosis, all kind of things basically would go up to COVID nineteen. What do you see in here? Probably you can't tell because we need expertise to tell about this story. So this is asthma cases. Asthma has this problem. I don't really see what is in there, by the way. We need exports. This is pneumonia cases. I even don't, I even don't know how am I going to different, differentiate this asthma case and pneumonia cases. How about COVID-19 cases? Ha, who can identify this one is different from this one? Possibly not. We are computer scientists. We don't want to make any mess in, in the world of a, a, a pandemic, right? We can't make any, any more pandemic because we make sort of just sort of just run the season in in the middle of pandemic, right? So this is tuberculosis cases again. One important thing that you got to know is this: this is wrong, this is abnormal, this is abnormal, and this is normal. Oh my God, that's that's complicated, right? So what I can see is all about the patterns, the the content inside lung section. These are things that keep changing. Or otherwise, otherwise fine. But how about all a small things in here like high or enlargement, right? These are these are some cloud uh, uh, structures, white pixels, right? These are on, on here. So how about we go back again one more time? Come on, it's the same thing, right? COVID nineteen, tuberculosis, all these the same things. So for us, computer scientists, we don't care about who is who. We care about what is basically different from what is normal. Right? What is different from normal? And that's what we care. Or we would not really like to take a look and have all these luxury having. Let me rephrase again. Not every computer scientist have luxury to have medical experts on the game in their game. It's important. It's it's important to know. Medical centers they do have expertise and they also have computer scientists that build things together. By understanding each other, but not everybody has got that luxury. Meaning, we just go with a, a, a computer reason toolbox, basically deep learning, because we're lazy to know and we're lazy to hire. We don't have money to hire medical expertise. Let's let's take it aside. We're, what am I going to do? Is to tell you a story about tuberculosis first. This has been done when I was at National Library of Medicine, the National Institutes of Health. I was one of the core members. I'm going to tell you the story. Tuberculosis basically is a big deal because it kills that many people and too many people. I don't want to talk about the TB is big because I'm a medical doctor. I don't have to advocate about this one. But again, important things to know is top 10 countries, India, China, in Indonesia, Nigeria, all the way to Congo. These are the top, the top 10 countries according to the number of TB manifestations. So how people do in hospital settings, two ways. Number one, uh, skin test. Number two, uh, cough test. So, so cough test and skin test. These are two two, two different ways to, to test whether you got to tuberculosis manifestations. Meaning, it is time consuming, it is expensive, and it's frustrating, right? So, what we want to do is let's do massive screening because we want to eradicate TB in no time. 
That's what the idea of uh, AI in place, right? So in resource constraint reasons, possibly you don't have doctors, or if you have, then they're so-called doctors, they're technicians, but not more than that. And they, they probably take more time than, than, than we think of. So what we want to do is to have all these populations in here and detect right away, oh, this lady has got tubal process, right? So in no time, this is what we want. That's what the idea of AI in place for tubal process screening. Let's take an example of South Africa, sorry, uh, now Kenya. Getting data is very important because you want to work with the real world data. And here is, here is the truck, you've been in Kenya uh, with the US AID and every, everything in, in place. So, so what we're going to do is the following. So you have the chest X-ray inside and people walk in and this, this truck basically is moving, is driving from one, one, one town, one village to other village. So you can have many, many, many people get in. And, and otherwise, you, if you just wait in the hospital, hospital settings, people don't come because they, they prefer play soccer or, or you call football and have a good life. But to get the data, you've got to have a truck and drive. Its truck has been driving from one place to the other place, meaning one place to the place. You're getting there, just x-ray, and you have a machine here. And we have on the fly out iCloud. Uh, we have clouds, and then we go up and analyze the, analyze the results. Have the have the decision done in less than two to five seconds when the guy is yeah. out from the truck. When the, when the guy is out from the truck, he's gonna get either he's got tuberculosis or not. Important thing, not like hospital settings. You always have a problem in taking pictures, meaning chest X-ray, right? Sometimes it, it is because of proper penetration, not proper penetration. Uh, a person's patient's inspiration, inhaling problem, or sometimes a severe attack. So orientation is a big deal. So orientation of all orientation is a big deal. The way the, the hospital uh, exports, meaning medical doctors take is to take the clavicle heads and see the spinous process, if they're equidistant, life is good, this is upright, no orientation, no nothing. But it's pretty much hard for computer vision scientists because detecting clavicle heads are okay, but having a small deviation while detecting clavicle heads, that makes amazing in terms of decision making. So what I what I what I try in that, that time is to do uh, Reeves detection. I said, how about rib detection? How about if the rib detection is going to work that way? Why? Because if the clavicle heads got a problem in terms of alignment, I'm talking about mislocation, right? Then the whole body is going to be moved because the whole whole lung section is going to be moved, meaning the ribs. There are 12 pairs of ribs. If I miss one of them, it's not a big deal. So what is the deal is, and here is, so you're going to have the global orientation of, of the ribs from both sides with respect to horizontal axis. And if they're equivalent, then we figure out there is no problem in, in terms of rotation. So that's the idea, the new idea. How am I going to do it? Because, because the idea is we're looking for lung sections. We do a region of interest, basically lung segmentation, go for eyes map, right? And do convolution. Well, do convolution, you need to create coronals in terms of Gaussian distribution. But that's why you got the camel camel hub in the middle. A more, you know, a contrast high in the middle and a lower. It means it's like a normal distribution, right? I'm talking about Gaussian distribution. That makes sense for us when we do convolution. Then you can have a, a ribs kind of more curvy in nature. Detection, rib detection, right? It's because of this one. So while doing so, we do for all possible angles from zero to 180, basically zero and 180 the same. So zero to 179. And we got the histogram and then we, we got histogram for both sides, left, long, right, left and right long section for the ribs. And we see that this one is not rotated because the distance, the, the angles are equal, but this one has a difference, which is 36 minus 22. That means the difference is here. So we can make it up right. It's easy corrections. So once you correct that, it is possible to have the, all these things back to normal, meaning we do quality control to normal. So common pulmonary abnormalities are these. We don't need to care about basically computer vision scientists don't care about all these problems. They care about what is changed with respect to what is normal or what has been changed with respect to what is normal, right? So this one is normal. I, this is cool. This, oh, some, some lung shapes our internal content, or so many things since, and basically cloud structure and so on. So we're talking about all these things, then 
When I do lung segmentation automatically, you see lung shape has been changed. This is severe case. This is a little severe case, but this is normal case. Lung shape reminds them, almost reminds them that it is expected, uh, right? But this one, a little change that this one is a severe one. So think about the following. If we do a computer vision technique, which is symmetry analysis, basically it's all about finding line of symmetry for all cases up to here. This one is a difficult case. It's because nature, this one is a difficult case, a little difficult, but not compared to this one. This one is a more easier compared to all, all the things right when it's easier because we just need to find thorax or abdomen, right? This one is published some time ago in 2018 and atrial transaction for medical imaging. So while talking about these things, think this thing, think of the following. If we look for symmetry between two long sections, then these are two long sections, you just pull them. If I feel like this is cool, very nice overlap, 100% overlap, then yes, that's what the symmetry exists, meaning no problem, no, no, long, no, no, no any change in long sections, meaning symmetry is high. So probably we say this is normal. Otherwise, the other two cases, the first one, the second one, never get or close to one value in terms of symmetry. This is high level understanding. How am I going to do that? Save one. Second, high, high level safe features, basically safe context. Everybody knows that in computer reason. How am I going to match all these things? Basically, you have, if just follow color, this is a color tone here, a red, red, and you have a safe, safe context, 100 sample points just for visualization. They try to match them, and at the end, your matching point, your matching cost is 0 0.12 or something. I don't know what is that number in here. Let's move a little bit. Yeah, 0 0.12, that means, that means you got, uh, uh, you got to pay that much amount of money, uh, 12 cents or so, to get things matched from both, both lung and right section. Again, we do the same thing. Like if you have a problem in chest X-ray, basically COVID-19 to pneumonia, tuberculosis, basically this is for tuberculosis. Then it looks like a, a winter tree branch after a snowy storm, right? We basically don't count any ribs here. The ribs orientation is already done. It's completely severe, collapsed, damaged. It means the histogram is gonna be really, really not nice. And thinking about both sides, this one, the blue one, is the left lung section, right one is the red one is the right lung section. If we go and mass the, do the overlap to take a symmetry in place, basically they don't have symmetry because you can, you see, you still, you still see that the red, red histogram is visible, meaning they don't overlap, they do like this. All right, so we move on uh, back in 60s, 50s, rhythm transfer, transfer has been used a lot in medical imaging for construction and this and that, this is very important, we try. So it, again, take a look, the, the upper case, the upper case in here is, is the severe case, the, the left lung section is a problem. That's why your, your overlap is not exist, doesn't exist here. While you got a, a little severe case, which, is, which, is, looks, which would look severe, but it's normal, and the overlapping is high. So if you see the symmetry analysis between two abnormal normal case, your overlapping is high in, in terms of normal case, but not, not a normal case. So symmetry exists. And again, we, we didn't talk about the gist features. Basically, it's all about taking giver filters inside the lung system and try to make partitions and see whether the symmetry exists or not. Cool, right? Everything is good. This is how we do. How why, why am I doing this? All this shallow learning or handcrafted features. Why am I doing that? It's because we follow clinical experts. They tell us, do these things. This is what we see. It means our method follows clinical procedure, right? And we did, we did come up with the results using a simple machine learning conventional algorithms because features extract, extract, extracted, and you've got all these things wrong. Our method's giving you 90% area under the curve. 96 on other data sets is from China and 94 from other one, which is from India. So different data set, different results, but again, don't forget that there is there was a deep learning, uh, a deep convolutional neural network, deep learning model, sometime in 2017, and this paper published in 2018. Good stuff, what we did, we did nothing. We got feature extraction based symmetry, and we got, we got this number of, you know, people can laugh at us because, oh, come on, Bayesian network, multi-layer perceptron, random force, all these things. These are, these are umpa -umpa stuff coming, but, Remember, we follow clinical procedure in terms of 
extracting features. Think about following cross population test. Train exists. Do you think that how then how difficult it is? Let's talk about the COVID nineteen in 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 China in in the very beginning. I'm not talking. I'm not. I, I try. I try not to be racist here, but when when the when the COVID nineteen started, why not we take the training model from the source where it, it was started and apply in Italy, in Spain, or other other places because that's what we call uh, training in one place, testing different place. Does it is it is it really happening in medical medicine? Possibly not because we're so sensitive about not making mess. So and also it is because of image data. The machines used in China, Italy, in in France, Germany, they could be different. When machines difference intensity variations, so and change in demography too. So AIDS, these that, you know, races, all these things will change everything. That's why in, in medical medicine, cross population trend test model hardly exists. Then, then educations in education training. We're not going to stop here because we, we try to see what happens. So the, what, what happened is we try to use Montgomery County data, US data, and test science data. We try combine both data and training and then it, it test with one data. And we try see we try to see whether it works and we found encouraging results. Pretty much good. We, we have never said that. We have never said that it's, it's a good idea to do it, but we said it's possible to do it. So when we when we start thinking about cross population trend test model, then it is possible that it is possible that we have to say the no to future engineering because if you apply uh, features based on Montgomery County data in US in the US, it is not going to work entirely because the machines are different, like I said, and demographics change and everything. So no to future engineering, and then we come up with the idea of a cross population trend test model using deep learning, and we published that in 2020. And remember that we didn't really make a big deal at that time, but, but our results say that it is possible that we can go up to 92% precision, 93% specificity, and 87 and 95 uh, area sensitivity and area ended curve. And our sigma value is really small, it means it's possible if we got bigger data, possibly it happens. But most of the time, it is important to take a look is uh, foreign objects like coin, nipple, jewelry, bottle cap, rings and so many, so many, right? These so many stops basically making a mess. Doctors, they know this is nipple. Doctors, they know this is nipple. It's not a problem. It's not abnormality. Doctors, they know this is jewelry. We, we, we can avoid it because we're looking for TB manifestation. Doctors, they know this is a pacemaker. That doctors, they know this is a button. But the machine, if we just feed the, this data into machine, machine doesn't know it looks like this is abnormal object. An abnormal object, Will, will make the decision abnormal too. So it is basically, look for, we're looking for a deep neural network uh, uh, to detect for an object, say x-rays, and it's very important. And it's, it's, it's good to avoid all these things before we start deep learning. Long story short, we should make things complicated. If the problem is too simple, better not, not try deep learning because deep learning looks sexy and everybody likes it, but maybe try to try to go with it really core. Cool. Because the problem is too simple. Why, why am I saying so? Is, is you got a shovel and you got a spoon. You have two tasks to do. One is cleaning dry boy. Other one is a coffee. You, you want to drink coffee. What do you want to use for coffee? You probably want to use spoon. Not, big, not shovel because shovel is big. And you're not going to use a spoon to clean dry boy uh, because you need to clean the snow uh, in, the, in the morning before you get to office. So you really have to know. Sobel looks nicer, bigger, but you're not going to use that one when, when you drink coffee. So better take a look because using sexy term don't make any sense in education training. All right, so back to COVID-19 now. I'm gonna spend a little time here, uh, probably 15 minutes and so, uh, COVID-19 because we did discuss quite, quite a things earlier. Let's talk about two things now. Number one, how, what have we done so far? Have we really considered clinical implications? How many publications done we, would, we have done so far in education training? And in all these publications require clinical implication, of course, but have we done so far? Probably not. We are in the rat race. We try to publish things and, and say that I published that one. It don't make any sense to clinical experts because they don't follow it. We publish somewhere, somewhere else where the clinical experts never read this, these papers. You write uh, one paper, let's say COVID-19, 
and you publish now applied soft computing. Do you think medical export is these exports that read those those journal articles? No, you better go to health health informatics, just health informatics, where where indexing is right and medical exports read the paper. That that is how we change the world, not about publication. So think about again one more time. COVID nineteen is dangerous, like lung cancer TB, but COVID nineteen hits a lot of people more on TB. Why? It's because the spread rate. So when we talk about spread rate, it's important to talk about mortality rate. Have we established mortality rate eight? No, not eight, because it's ongoing, never finished. While talking about all these things, how am I going to say that COVID-19 is a big threat? Because of mortality and recovery rate. Back to WHO, meaning conventional uh, mortality rate computation model. We revisited some time ago in, uh, uh, and, and tried to figure out COVID-19 mortality and recovery rates by figuring out WHO missed recovery time period while computing mortality rate. That is alarming, but it is, we don't want to say it is incorrect. If you say you have, if you say you have 300 people infected today, do you want to say three, number of dates divided by 300 people? Because you say just infected today in the morning. Don't mean that you have to be, you have to, you have to have the 300 people in denominator because you need to wait. If you want to go for death rate called computation, you need to wait minimum average recovery period and you can compute death rate. So you can include 300 people. Because of that, the mortality rate of WHO is way down because they include all people in the denominator, which is not right. They have to wait at least an average recovery time period. That's what the reason here. If you see classical one, this is WHO. Well, I, I don't want to say WHO, but this is conventional. If it is a progressive, why we call progressive? Because we have not determined mortality rate yet. It is a progressive one until things done. Basically, this is this is a, this is the one that we we work on synthetic data of two hundred people in one village. So if you take a look in here, the blue one, the mortality rate is too small because they take everything into account, but we don't take them. We wait fourteen days because recovery time period for for a human uh, in terms of COVID nineteen infection is fourteen days. While waiting fourteen days, we don't take all these people; they just get infected in the morning today, right? So our mortality rate is high, but if everybody get in, gets infected, we will move down all the way, all the way, and, and we reach and we reach each other. It basically, we meet. That meeting point tells us that we compute mortality and recovery rates. When the people don't die, it should be recovery rate, right? When, when people die, then it's going to it's go for a death rate, which is what we call mortality rate, right? So conventional, again, one more time, Conventional mortality rate never, never consider the, the average recovery time period. That's why their mortality rate is way lower than ours. All right. So, but, but the thing is, that we don't want to say it's bad. We meet at the end. Every, when everything is done, we meet because they're, they're still right, we're right too. So I don't want to talk about those things. It's come up blaming, but we published the paper some time ago in Journal of Medical Systems in 20, 20 October. Right, so back to the story, but prediction models, again, it is important. So we can always compute mortality, death rate, or recovery rates at the same time while talking about prediction models too. So let's talk about prediction models. There are one, two, three, three broadly classified predict statistical models. One is SIR, basically for uh, uh, COVID-19, other, other infectious disease outbreak, as in based curve fitting. Curve fitting is really popular. SIR is really popular. But one thing that you really want to say and want to, want to consider is no statistical model take unprecedented factors or events into account. For instance, hospital settings, test capacity rate, daily basis, demographics, population density, vulnerable people. I'm talking about immunocompromised people and poverty. Poverty. If the poverty goes down, you think they can buy food? No. If they don't buy food, buy food, then they cannot eat. But that means the immune power goes down. All these, all these. Factors never, never, never taken into account in any statistical models. Alarming. 
when we do all these kind of things and, and predict something, it is garbage and garbage out. That's what I call here in this paper, COVID-19 prediction models. This is the paper that I published in Journal of Medical Systems 2020. Uh, uh, and unexploited data. These data never been exploited. That means it's alarming. So these tests or whatever model should be limited to education and training. But what happened? How about media? This is something different because we're not limited to education and training. We make scientists, basically computer scientists, all, uh, uh, almost make a, a another pan, uh, another pandemic in the middle of the pandemic saying that tomorrow we're gonna to have that many cases rise, basically not, not possible. It's because they didn't take down present factor. No, one more thing that I'm gonna make, make it loud and clear, no statistical model will tell you that what time and day you're gonna die, right? Enough. So what is important, take a look behind the scene. Behind the scene, the prediction models rely on data. And that data, it should be really consistent. If the camel hump, I'm, I'm saying camel hump or Gaussian, Gaussian distribution is really, really big, tall. Then we can say that most of the data talking about exact same thing. Then it makes sense that prediction goes right. But if the camel hump, meaning Gaussian distribution is going flatter and flatter and flatter, that means most of the data is sparse. The sparse data never take you to make a decision consistently. Think about this, this is a blue line, the blue line, blue, Gaussian distribution is a big deal for us. We need to look after the data, how data has been collected. If the data collected and data shows that, that nice attitude or characteristics, then it makes sense to predict because the prediction goes right. Nobody intends. And most of the things that prediction model. So one thing that it is important to take a look, prediction models basically is very stark. It is a short term prediction model. If we just look up there, look for car based Carb based is just about equation, right? It's a higher order polynomial equation. And this one is not the right fit, be degree one, degree two. And you will basically want to go for overfitting. When you do overfitting, you think this is going, this is going to go here? No, it probably go down. This is impossible. But for short term, five days, 10 days, it is possible to predict. Predict is just prediction, not give you an actual value. But this one, this prediction is way far from what is the what is the, the actual one is. So everybody is making mess in the world basically this time. And we got millions of papers published in this. So publications we do just to make people fool, not more than that. Message loud and clear. Data visualization is not prediction. If you see your LinkedIn, Facebook, and this and that, they always plot all these kind of things. Anybody can plot, even my kids who is who is in kindergarten, no, grade two. He is basically plotting all these things by himself. Is this, is the plotting or data visualization is the prediction? Hey, man, stop it. We should, we, should, we academicians should be a scientist. That scientist should predict, not visualize. Visualize is for those who just wanna see the train. This gives us train, don't mean that it's gonna predict. So something is wrong. So I wrote this book some time ago. So it's, it's in the price the book is gonna come out. So it's a deep learning models for medical imaging. And this is a book coming out probably in, in, in a month or so. Hey, again, one more time. We're not going to use deep learning. There are so many authors that use deep learning for one vector, one data, which is just a vector. Like every day, how many cases you have this number? So 30 days, 30 number. You think deep learning is gonna apply for 30 numbers because 30 days data? No, because the hyperparameters will be way bigger than the number of data as an input. Then what do you do? You do parameter prediction, basically, not the data prediction. So it's a garbage and garbage out, right? So people don't understand all these things. So here's basically what is, what is important for us to take a look is this. This is really important, cross-population, active learning, and multimodal data. This one I published some time ago in March 2020, as soon as the COVID-19 hits. And the idea is this, it's, it's a, we know that data is not available. So it's, it's a time series data. Every day we got data because of COVID-19. COVID-19 hits really hard humanity. So how many data types, CT scan, CIS tax rate, these, that, I don't know how many data types, I'm not a medical expert, but no radiologist was made, was prepared for COVID-19, right? No, no radiologist, but they became expert after a couple of months. Why not our machine? If the radiologist, they can be expert after a couple of months, then the machine can do that. So why not we go parallel? Let's, do, let's have a take a look. So we have a deep learning, we have data type one, data number one. So 10 days, 10 data, 
of course, the data scientist is going to be improved. Radiologists, they learn things after 10 days, first day, they're kind of what, what right? 10, 11 days, they, they got new experience, and our machines basically got new experience. A machine can always make mistakes like human does. But if we have the radiologist in place get, giving a feedback for every possible data, it is possible to make that, that machine available for, for some other places to use like humans or radiologists or experts after 200 days. So this is important that we call active learning within the closed loop framework, okay? Deep learning is gonna use data from, so that's where active learning. So deep learning is gonna use data with the help of the experts over time. That means we learn data over time with the help of uh, uh, doctors in the loop, in the, in the, in the, in the a closed loop framework. How about that? So this is gonna make a decision, right? And we can use this one for later. Purpose. So two data types is basically provide for public research. So we're talking about this when we come up with the cello, cello inceptionate, basically a truncated one. This one is the, the idea of that we did and that we published the paper sometime in 2020, June, immediately after we get hit. So to all our data that we got, COVID-19, pneumonia, tuberculosis and healthy. So all these cases, this is the data type. This is the features that we got. And these are how the accuracy is going to be maintained. If you see the D, D, D number six, D6, basically 99 uh, uh, accuracy, 99 error in the curve, kind of alarm. You do everything right, but basically, maybe because of limited data. We don't know it's been biased or not because we can go more than that. This is the results and comparison is pretty much good, right? Don't forget that. 25 images in use, images were used some time ago in 20, March, April, and so. You think 25 images is okay? No, but what they can do, they can wait for another year, right? They can, they can just publish paper and see whether it's, it works fine. We go up to 162 and show. We try to see whether, whether two different modalities give us some similar manifestations about uh, COVID-19. And we, we, did, we did two different experiments, uh, one separate experiments for CXR, test X-ray and CD. The other one is just, just making them together, combine and see what, what is happening. So basically, one architecture for both the data types, and one architecture for, uh, for integrating, well, integrating data types makes sense, All right? We work, we work that way. So what we understand is test X-ray and CD scans, CD images, these two images, if we talk about exact same particular event, which is COVID-19, they could have, okay, they could have come up with, with, with the similar manifestations of COVID-19. It makes sense to use both of them. Don't forget the smart healthcare because we try to use many different data types, making one decision uh, uh, by integrating um, uh, those many sources, right? So COVID-19 amazing tools, how big is big? How big data is big? Just published some time ago, probably to one month ago. I was like sick of having all these things. I published this paper and because of this, this is the result. So in, back, in, back in time, uh, we got 71 images, 307 images, all the way up to 18,000 images, which is our paper. This is my paper with my student. So you think in machine learning, we call all the time, bigger the data, higher the performance. Larger the data, higher the, higher the performance. Do you think it's possible? Let's take a look here, 100%. Sometime, sometime again, 2021, this is, the data said it's 1,061 images and you got 100% accuracy, 100, 100, 100. Wow, I don't know it's overfitting or not. Underfitting, overfitting, whatever you call, call. But again, you, you got something. So it is not about that. Bigger the data site, it is possible to have many, many possible COVID-19 manifestations. We wanna see new, new cases. Not, we don't wanna have big data. Yes, we do have, we do wanna have big data, but when we, we really wanna see new cases, new manifestations, so that the, the machines can, can be trained. Having larger data and repeated, repeatedly having the same exact, exact same cases over and over, which is which I saw before, don't make any sense. Big data always welcomes new manifestations, which is nice, but if big data is always repeating the same thing, don't make, really make sense. So cross-population test, trend test model is pretty good. So combining different data from different regions, are really good. That's what I'm talking about here. Same thing, right? So one important thing that we really want to take a look is this one. 
model fitting issues nobody talked in 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 the, in the publications we got in 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 20 this year february march we forget we got millions of papers published on tech covid 19 they never talk about model fitting issues they just use deep learning as a black box without understanding clinical procedure and publish and i got this sci paper this and that that doesn't make sense because we should serve humanity we also respect the people and so so that so that the COVID-19 case, this kind of infectious disease outbreak of this would be solved in no time. Model fitting issues, nobody talked about this. Data augmentations, people use it for fun because it is not bicycle, it is not object detection, it is not bicycle detection, car detection, tree detection building. It's not about that computer vision, it works fine. Data augmentation is all about rearranging pixels so that we can see new cases in there. But do you think rearranging pixels from here to here, here to here? give us new COVID-19 manifestation for manifestations. Do you think that's going to be solved? That's going to be proved? Who annotated that? Nobody. Nobody used medical experts to take a look. Data augmentation is just a buzzword. It may work, it may not work, but nobody has proved that data augmentations work really fine. It is not about 99%, 200%. It is about convincing medical experts and public health care. So can we follow transfer learning? If we follow transfer learning, how about the cyst x-rays for tuberculosis? We have 100K or more data set. Why not we use that model for COVID-19? Yes, we used, but didn't work. That means in healthcare, it is important to take a look at very specific model specific problem or problem specific model. We have to build that one. Think, thing is this, again, nobody knows how big data is big. We're looking for new manifestations. We're not looking for numbers. Of course, opening doors will get new manifestations. Many opening doors means increasing data is gonna give us new manifestations, but repeating don't make, don't make any sense. That's what the idea is. So something is here. Uh, I really wanna talk, talk, talk about some things, but let me do this one for, for a second. For the water break. This is the one that um, my students working out here, first, first, first detection for the campus. And this is nothing but, but trying, to, trying, to, trying to use all this deep learning stuff for, uh, for helping them understand, for helping them understand in, in, in the lab. It is a nice looking one, so I'm gonna stop from here uh, and a move on. Uh, let, let us have a little more fun uh, from uh, robotic sites and robotics is, is cool stuff in here. Other one could be better. Is it in that same one? I don't know. If it is the same one, I keep moving. Let's see. This is more intelligent than the other one because he decided he decided to go work. This is a mess solving robotic problem. We have we have a, a robotics competition at USD regional companies and we do this for this this kind of things for high school students. The last move is nuts. It's going to stop because there is no way to go. This is fully artificial intelligence uh, uh, built robotics stuff in here. So if you want to know more, I'm, I'm kind of more towards health. I run uh, uh, almost every day, seven to eight miles. And this is my boy running with me all the time. And if you want to know more about uh, our my lab here, uh, please uh, write me an email. Here is an email ID, and go from my website. Last, two kids, and either you do your job or not, but back to home. You got kids, a family. Family is important. Health is important. But please take a look. And I have to announce one thing before I uh, leave you for Q and A. We have fourth international conference on recent trend. Trends in medic image processing and pattern recognition, which is going to be in University of Malta. Malta. Uh, please take a look. Thank you very much. Let's go for QA. Thank you.
I know I'm taking time, but I used to do this talk for uh, 90 minutes or 120 minutes, but I, I, I believe I can make it time. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you, Professor Santosh, um, for the knowledge and uh, for things uh, that uh, we haven't had before. So now I open the, you can type your questions in the chat box or you can uh, unmute yourself and uh, ask the question. Well, let me get you started, Professor. So, uh, you know, uh, you were saying that uh, uh, predictive models have not used the unexploited data for COVID-19 prediction. So uh, has your team uh, compared the differences between uh, the use of unexploited data for prediction and uh, not using it? No. Oh. Let me let me back up a little bit in here. So on on unprecedented uh, factors, for instance, poverty and uh, mm, hospital settings, right? Test test capacity of the political settings in the region. All these things vary a lot, right? And and the the, the number of immunocompromised people, they are, they are serious. And nobody has talked about this. Nobody can have the data. It's because of lack of data as well, also, because they, don't, they didn't really tune these things that way. What we did try is by taking number of immunocompromised people, having different weights for that one. How, how are we going to adopt weights? The reason is, uh, the 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 idea behind this is to to take a look how many people die for that particular case. For instance, immunocompromised people. How many people die in the last two months, last four months, five months? That makes us feel the weight for immunocompromised people in that particular region should be higher than the other weights. You know, those double one, double two, and so on. These weights should be higher. So what, why, while talking about all these things, we realized at the, at the point is all these prediction models are limited to short-term predictions because of long-term predictions, almost impossible to do it. That's why my, my take home message at some point to die in the middle is no statistical models can tell you when I'm gonna die, what time and where. It's because of that. Because we're, we're having so many different factors taken into account. And talking to your friends, talking to, to somebody else, then you get motivated or demotivated, or you got different moral. All these things are connected, and these connections cannot be solved by statistical models. Right? That's why it is easy for me to tell people that, based on my experience, no statistical models can help understand when I'm going to die. That's why, remember, we say the lifespan of South Asian is 60 to 70, or whatever, right? I'm just putting the name. Our lifespan of American, North American is, say, 70 to 80. It's because we keep the range. We are so smart making, making range in that way, right? So, so I, I, I really don't have a, a, a loud and clear answer for that one. But again, the question is the answer is this. No statistical model can decode all these unprecedented events. That's why, that's why the, this should be limited to education and training, not taking these things out and, and have the media coverage there. Finally, what happened is we just, we just scare people, right? We scare people for no reason. Thank you, Professor. So there, there are a few questions in the chat. All right, so let me see one. How can we benefit from blockchain and artificial intelligence for sorting patients, best medical data and detect criminals or in bad use? Uh, uh, I cannot advocate a lot about blockchain. 
Yeah, probably that's out of your scope. Yeah, uh, how yeah. about uh, the other one? How does artificial intelligence help in medical data protection? Medical data protection start just in recent years. Not we never we never thought that way because of COVID nineteen and other serious uh, effects for humanity. And people started working in here, even uh, undergrad, and graduate student, uh, uh, early career research scientists, and this and that. We used to have very limited people working in the domain. After COVID-19, people start seeing that this is a way to get published. And they publish like event. It's like a winning storm. And nobody, nobody knows that what is good, what is not good. We make people, people fool at, at some point. So of course, medical, the AI is going to be another, another tech for everybody, not just for healthcare. Of course, he is going to do that. Yeah, AI is everywhere from, from healthcare to risk management. I'm talking about dollar amount. Right. So everything is with AI, but it doesn't mean that we publish like event. We publish things exactly what it is, but people sometimes manipulate it. Um, um, uh, let me tell you something. We should not publish paper because we want to make people fool and basically what it is, the reality. But understanding things, understanding things right and publish things right is, is a good idea to serve the society and community, basically humanity. Yeah, there's uh, another one from uh, Professor Hakik. Can we use some hybrid approaches based on AI to improve the to improve predicting infectious diseases? That is that is a, that is always a good idea. That's why my question is clear. Instead of just look 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 looking at one data type and and and, and detect COVID nineteen or any infectious disease outbreak. It is, it is good to use all possible data types, integrate and see whether they talk about consistency, right? If I have a HIV positive, my, my whole thing is changed. The way I communicate is gonna be changed. The pitch is gonna be changed if I have some positive, some, some positive results, right? It is possible to use all possible data types. What is happening today is chest X-ray, chest X-ray, chest X-ray, and I detect this one. Do you think it's going to solve and people believe and we make it commercialized? No. It is just about making people fool. I beat you by 2%. I beat you by, beat you by uh, 0.01% even with sigma value, right? That doesn't really make sense. Let's talk about is smart healthcare. That, that is going to take or integrate all possible data types for exact same event and see whether the, all these data types talking about consi talking consistently about that event if it is so, our decision is right. We can make smart healthcare right away by 2030. We should be spending time here, not about chest X-ray, chest X-ray, chest X-ray. I give 25 mazes, and I'm, of course, in March 2020, people don't have images, but that's a good start. But after that, basically, it's event. It's a winning story. No more than that. I agree with that one. Hybrid approaches, hybrid approaches, and also, also possible data types. We do like to see multi-model learning. We do like to see where the CT scans and chest x-rays providing us exact or similar, exact or similar manifestations of COVID-19. COVID-19 is an example, whatever comes into play in, uh, uh, in the future, uh, any infectious disease outbreak. Would you like to see, would you like to see many different data types integrated and talk about the exact same event? So, so decision making is robust and enough to be to be convinced. Otherwise, don't really make sense. You think it documented, so if you see here, the image processing, this, this, this final data, this final region documents is enough to make a decision for tuberculosis, by the way, because they write everything here. It doesn't mean that this is going to be commercialized because we need all data from the starting of the day. Pattern recognition and your attitude or character characteristics can happen. It's possible to happen in reality only when I know when you get up when you get back, get back home, all this data, if I know for 100 years, I can make it possible. Not 100 years, let's make it real, reality, realistic, 10 years. And I know that which leg is going to go in your pant immediately after you get, get up from the bed, left or like, right, I can tell you. But we need the data from when we get up, up to, up to when I get back home from office. Then people know that where, 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 what time, where am I, basically, right? That's what we call pattern recognition. That's what we call 
uh, 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 anomaly detection if something happens in the way while driving. Thank you. That was a good question. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Santosh. I think um, uh, that's it for us, uh, for all the questions. Yeah. And uh, thank you for your excellent presentation and uh, the knowledge that uh, you have shared with us. We hope to keep in touch and uh, make contact again for future conference engagements and invite you to speak again. Thank, thank you, you very so much. much. Thank uh, you. Thank you for. Uh, oh, 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 oh. Yeah. Also, from my side, Professor Santosh, thank you so, so much for your interesting and nice presentation. And uh, we keep in touch. Uh, thank you so much, Professor uh, Gounder, for sharing this nice session. And uh, thank you for all the, uh, the attendees. Uh, we have a break now. And we will start our the oral sessions uh, around the, at the. Uh, 50 o'clock at 50 o'clock uh, then we will see here then we have a, a break about uh, 50 minutes and uh, please uh, uh, be uh, with us and uh, see you uh, see you soon thank you professor thank you everyone see you. all right thank you very much sometimes uh, one yes. more time if you have yeah. any 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 anything that you would like to work with me Please apply. We have funding for that one. We're going to start yeah, sure. Institute for AI and Data Science very soon from fall 23 mm -hmm. next year. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you so much. much. Thank you so much. Be safe. Because I told you we come back at uh, 5 o'clock uh, p.m. for more in Morocco time, please.